to you about the single most fundamental principle of economics, at least in my view. Economics, remember, is about choosing. It's deciding what you're going to do with what you've got. It's deciding how to allocate the reasonably scarce resources that you have. And inevitably, when you decide to choose one direction or one use of your resources, you have to give something up because there's not enough to do everything. The principle is scarcity. There's never enough to do everything we'd like to do, whether it's money, time, or any other resource. So this fundamental principle of scarcity is best illustrated with a word or an acronym called TANSTAFFEL. TANSTAFFEL, most important part of it about economics. Don't ever forget it. What does it mean? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Nothing is free. In economics, we view the choices we make and we say no choice is free. If I tell you, for example, I'm going to pay for your entire education, and so you obligate to go into a four-year course of study and pursue a bachelor's degree, and I pay for all your costs, your tuition, your books, your living expenses, your housing, etc. Was that a free education to you? And the answer is no, not really. Because we also have to ask, while you were going to school for those four years, what did you give up? What could you have been doing? That's what we call opportunity cost. It's what was the next best use of that resource? What was the next best use of your time? You could have spent four years uh, in a job, on a career track, you could have four years seniority, and you gave that up in order to go to school full-time full for four years. So what we're, we're pointing out with Tanstaffel is, at least in, in the general sense, everything has an opportunity cost. When you come to class today, what did it cost you? It may have cost you some, some uh, gasoline in your vehicle or bus fare, and... It may have cost you some pro rata portion of your tuition that you paid for the course. What else did it cost you? It cost you the time you spent coming to school that you could have used in some other way. You could have been working at a job. You could have been sleeping, right? Well, that's your opportunity cost. It's what you gave up. You gave up that two or three hours sleep to come to class today. So nothing's free. And so we'll use this term frequently just as we observe the world around us, tan staff it. Look at the choices you're making and recognize every choice have a, has a cost. Tan staff it. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Now, we pursue this a little further. We, we elaborate, give it a little more depth in economics through the use of something called a production possib possibilities frontier, or some people call it a production possibilities curve. Let's take a look at that. We assume a fairly simple world where there are two choices. We have a, an economy that can choose to produce defense goods, tanks, missiles, planes, soldiers, guns, or it can produce consumer goods. Refrigerators, Coca-Cola, food, uh, theaters, okay, such as that. And we argue that there are two extremes. If you allocate all your production into defense, here is the maximum amount, amount of defense you can produce, just to make it simple, 100 units of defense. <coughs> Alternatively, if you put all of your production into consumer goods, let's say that you can produce... 400 units of consumer goods, some basket of uh, consumer products and services. We probably don't want to be at either extreme, but we start asking, well, if I, if I have less consumer goods in order to produce some defense goods, how much do I have to give up of consumer goods for each additional unit of defense goods? What happens is we wind up with a relationship that's reflected with this curved line. Now, 
without getting into marginal rates of substitution, what we're basically illustrating is the first few units of defense take, you, take very little from your consumer goods. That is, you could be here at point A, where you have almost the same amount of consumer goods, but you gave up a little in order to get some defense goods. And as you proceed down the, the curve, if you were to go to point B, you have given up some more consumer goods, and you have gained significantly more defense goods. And if you continue to substitute down in this direction, giving up consumer goods to get more defense goods, what you eventually find is that when you got down, say, to here, and you wanted to go to here, you're going to have to give up a fairly large amount of consumer goods to get a fairly small increase in defense goods. Originally, you give up a little consumer, more defense. But as you get further down in here, the substitution isn't as smooth, and so you have to give up progressively more units of consumer goods for each additional unit of defense goods. Now, this concept says this then, this curve, is your production possibility frontier. These are points at which you could operate different combinations of consumer and defense goods. You can be anywhere on that curve you want. Where do you want to be? And that's a subjective choice. The society is going to decide that perhaps through voting and politics or in an author authoritarian regime. They're going to decide we're going to be down here or not up there or whatever. But the point remains Theoretically, you can locate anywhere you want along that production possibilities frontier, but it's a possibilities frontier. It is possible to operate out here if you allocate your goods and use them efficiently. However, what if you're stuck over here? Let's say that right here you're operating with 250 units of consumer goods, and 50 units of defense. You're operating right here, we'll call that point X. Is that the best you can do? And the answer is no. You're not being efficient in the use of your resources. If you were, you could either continue to operate with 50 units of defense and produce maybe 300 units of consumer goods. But because you are inefficient, you're located somewhere inside of the production possibilities curve. Maybe you could keep consumption at 250 units, but increase defense out to here, maybe to 80 units. So you could move out here and, with the same amount of resources, produce more. You could become more efficient. And so our general argument first is that any time you're inside the production possibilities frontier, you are inefficient. You are not using all of your resources as efficiently as you could. In a macroeconomic sense, that would mean that your economy is suffering some, from some high unemployment, some unused labor resources, folks who just don't have a job. So the object of first, at first then is to move out to the production possibilities frontier at whatever point you subjectively think is the best place to be, the best combination of these goods. Ideally, over time, we want to be able to move beyond this point, right? Can we move out to here? The answer is generally no, certainly not for any length of time, because that takes more resources than we have available. So what we hope to do over time is to maybe grow this production possibilities frontier progressively further and further out. How do we do that? We become more efficient with our resources, or we find more resources. We discover new resources that can be used, or maybe through technology or better management, we learn how to do more with what we have, and we shift this, the production possibilities curve further and further out. Over time, that would be ideal, and we would hopefully operate still somewhere out on the edge and get more output for the resources that we have available. Now, the real question now is, where should we be? Are we better off up here at point A, or are we better off down here at point B? And that becomes more opinion. And so let's illustrate the difference between
positive economics and normative economics. Positive economics are basically statements of fact. No opinion. It says, you know, if you reduce the wage rate in an economy, uh, you'll find that employers want to hire more workers because they're cheaper. If you drop the price of watermelons, people will drop, buy more watermelons. That's not an opinion. That's not saying that's good or that's bad. That's just saying that's the way the system operates. We try to teach economics from a positive point in the, in the, in the sense that here's the way we have modeled this. And here's the way we believe it works. We're not saying it's good or it's bad. We're saying that's the way it works. Normative economics is more opinion. I think we ought to be at point A because consumer goods are more important to us than defense goods. Alternatively, I think we ought to be at point B because we need more defense. Defense is very important. And so we have a difference of opinion now. You will hear opinion frequently in economics, and certainly if you pay attention to the news, read the literature, what's going on, you'll constantly have people making opinions and they'll be trying to make them sound like they're fact. And so one of the things you want to try to do in an economics course is learn to discern the difference when people are stating fact and when they are stating opinions but making it sound like a fact. Very common occurrence in politics around the world. All right? So what have we got now? We've got Tan Staffel, they ain't nothing free. We have trade-offs. That is, if we want more of one thing, we get less of another. And we have the opportunity cost of what we give up. And we have the idea of positive economics on this is the way the thing works, and normative economics on this is what I think we ought to do. Or sometimes, this is the way I think it works. No, I think it works this way. And we'll have difference of, of opinion here. So let's focus where we can on the facts so we all are speaking from the same common understanding of the way the system works. And then we'll entertain questions and comments and debates even on some of the normative issues at work out there in, in the world today. All right? Thanks.